Mr. Saber Lal, thanks for joining us and your readiness to answer our question. Uh, within economic and geopolitical context, what are the main challenges and opportunities for the economies of Central Asia uh, this year and next? Uh, just to set the context, um, the economies in the region fared very well last year and uh, some of them had very high rates of growth and overall growth, current accounts and fiscal deficits were all going in the right direction. The challenge right now is that we are going to see a moderation in, in growth levels and but at the same time also uh, a moderation in inflation which was very high last year but there's great uncertainty around that so if you ask the short-term question of this year and next year uh, policymakers need to make sure that the economies are resilient and robust uh, so that they can encounter any uh, uh, shocks that that are there or the impact of shocks that we may not have seen so far but may still play out at the same time the key challenge is to bring inflation down in all countries to levels closer to what the objectives are. Mm -hmm. So those are the two main challenges right now. now how do you see the development uh, of uh, financial sector, for example, property and labor markets of the countries in this region in the nearest perspective? So overall, the financial sectors in, in the countries have been uh, resilient throughout this period. And uh, some of them have indeed received very large inflows uh, of, uh, for instance, non-resident deposits, but they have uh, in many cases invested it uh, abroad in longer term uh, assets rather than let it be lent on lent domestically. So uh, they are protected from some of the uh, impacts that can happen when you get large, sudden large surges of inflows. Uh, but overall, based on financial soundness indicators, the financial sectors look to be in good shape. Mm -hmm. But uh, one has to be always mindful that situations can change and so the supervisory authorities are encouraged to continue to keep a close eye on that. Uh, in some cases, because of the migration, uh, inward migration uh, into countries, um, housing markets have been a bit more upbeat, shall we say, and rental prices have gone up. And those uh, can be addressed through a number of uh, uh, things uh, when needed, which is macroprudential measures, perhaps, um, that uh, limit credit to, to uh, you know, invest in houses, and also in some cases uh, improve the supply of housing mm -hmm. as well. And we already mentioned that economic shocks, which we uh, have witnessed, they played out positively yes. so far. But, uh, uh, what do you think, is it, um, is it stable? Can we say that it's stable and what is it more um, of um, permanent or temporary effect so on economies? Well, the short answer is it's very difficult to tell. Certainly what was seen last year was unusual and very positive and we are seeing a moderation in those trends. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing a reversal in the trends but just an easing and the, for instance remittances uh, at the rate at which they increase, the trade at the rate at which it increased in some cases cannot be sustained. And we are seeing a natural moderation of, of those trends uh, right now. And so that's uh, the picture we have in our baseline forecast as well. So the question is, I think there are, uh, well, it's hard to tell whether there would be a reversal. We don't have that in our baseline. Mm -hmm. And it would certainly depend on how the geopolitical situation plays out. And if you look at some of the migrant uh, uh, population, the high-skilled workers, for instance, coming do, uh, from Russia, do they stay in the region or do they move to a third country? All those things are unknowns right now. So one has to be very careful in making very sort of mm -hmm. confident proje uh, projections. Yes, and taking into account the geopolitical context, um, uh, specifically for Kazakhstan, how do you see will be trade relations with Russia and China be affected? And what should be an approach for trade policies in this case? I think the general answer is that uh, diversifying trade is always a good idea. And, um, but certainly, you know, Russia is next door neighbor, a very large trading partner. And, and so it's going to be an important trading partner. Uh, China is a very large economy also close by. But the general idea would be to think beyond just the immediate region, think globally, mm -hmm. and also to think of the composition of trade. Because for instance, if one thinks of commodity trades, uh, oil uh, and so on, 
but uh, improving living standards further and increasing incomes would mean diversifying more into the non-oil economy and becoming part of global value chains, not just regional value mm -hmm. chains, mm -hmm. in all new products and new services. Mm -hmm. And what geoeconomic movements do you foresee going forward? And again, what opportunities and risks it might be? So one of the big things that we are seeing uh, globally is technological change, which is happening very rapidly. And it's fundamentally changing how many economies work. What this means is uh, that you know services are becoming a large part of even trade because you can trade them across borders. Uh, being a landlocked country is less uh, of a, a hindrance than it used to be in the past, and a lot of the value-added services tend to happen uh, there as well. Uh, similarly, intangible investments. So investment, but that is not things that you know uh, uh, that occupy a physical space. Mm -hmm are also becoming important, you know, one things of software, branding, those are the important things also. So that's a big shift that is taking place uh, globally. And uh, so focusing on that, it is very important to be able to seize the opportunities to benefit from this fundamental structural shift. It is called the fourth industrial revolution, after all, it's a very big shift. Yes, yes. And, and what that requires is to create the infrastructure in a way the physical and human infrastructure for um, countries to be including in Kazakhstan to benefit from it, you know, education, training, skills, uh, connectivity, di including digital connectivity, those are all important. That's where the future is. Yes, and linking it with this region in particular. Yes. So, what trends, both economic and political, uh, will dominate here? In so, um, well, it. I think it's safe to say the region will and should get more integrated both with each other and with the rest of the world. That is going to be, I think, uh, a, a clear trend because we are unlikely to go back to the trade patterns that were there before last year. Mm -hmm. So looking at the landscape as it is now and any reasonable projection of how it will go forward, one of the things is that it is both desirable and likely, or we hope, that countries in the region will be more integrated with each other but also with the rest of the world, especially because uh, some of the economies in the region are smaller and mm -hmm. some of them are landlocked. So uh, in, in some sense, uh, uh, their greater regional integration is a great ticket to. So the idea of interconnectivity will grow. Is one of them, yes, indeed. I mean, and uh, as long as it is encouraged by policymakers, there's a lot of scope to exploit that for uh, the well-being and uh, improved living standards by all countries. So it has potential. Mm -hmm. But it will not just happen by itself. It needs to be seized by the policymakers. Thank you very much, Sabir Lal, for your time and for your answers. Thank you. Thanks. Very much.